And uh, I just want to start by telling you, uh, some of you may not believe this, but this whole journey started so innocently. I was, um, in July 2008, a correspondent sent me a list of um, excerpts from the acclaimed 1995 memoir of uh, Barack Obama called Dreams from My Father. I had not read it to that point, had not been paying that much attention to the campaign. And I found myself stuck in the Detroit airport uh, awaiting a flight delay on America's least glamorous flight, Detroit to Buffalo. And um, with um, very little to do, I went into the bookstore and it was like an Obama-rama. You know, there was uh, a dream for my father, audacity of hope, soft cover, hard cover. There were, dream there were Obama coloring books. There were Obama coffee table books. It was like the Obama store. And so I bought a um, copy of, the soft back copy of Dreams for My Father. And given my biases, I felt like, like an like an adolescent buying his first copy of Playboy. You don't have the National Review and um, uh, commentary, and, you know. But anyhow, as I started reading the book, uh, first of all, I discovered that the uh, excerpts in question were taken out of context. The book is not as radical as it sounds at all. The book is pretty calculated. And as I would learn later on as I was you know, doing my research, the book was not calculated to make uh, Barack Obama president of the United States. The book was calculated to make Barack Obama the mayor of Chicago in which position he would do Bill Ayer as a world of good. As president, he just presents him a, a world of you know, psychological and moral problems. The, as I get into it, uh, just to, in the way of description, the book is divided into three parts. The first part starts with a section called Origins, which basically tells his story from the time, even actually tracks back to his parents and takes him through his uh, departure for Chicago from New York City. The second part is the the longest and most tedious part of the book. It's called uh, Chicago. And it, and it almost reads like it was written for another book. The third part is Kenya. And uh, in what I discerned in reading the book was that it had the, a very comparable structure to the Homer's the Odyssey, which was interesting. And I, I wrote about this, and I described it. I described Obama as a combination of Telemachus seeking the father and the father seeking the homeland. Three weeks after I wrote that, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning a book critic for the New York Times, Michiko Kakatani, writes, this book combines, uh, is a combination of, of Obama as Telemachus seeking the father and the father seeking the homeland. I, I don't think she copied from me. I just think that that's the structure of the book. And I, I was probably the first one to see that. And that comes back into play, and I'll tell you why in just a little while. Now, as I read it, though, what intrigued me about it is that it was the best parts of it. Some of it wanders and some of it's tedious, but the best parts of it are very well written. And as I'm going to make the case tonight, uh, Bill Ayers may seem turgid when you see his, the agitprop that he writes, but on a sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph uh, basis, he writes extremely well. And he's not gotten credit for that, partly because we have to maintain that Obama is the sole author of this book. And I'll explain why that is not so and why we know that's not so. But in any case, as I was reading through the book, I was thinking there are two questions that emerged. And these two questions would form the basis of my book, uh, Deconstructing Obama. The first question was, did Barack Obama write this book? And the second question is, is the story he tells true? And as I would come to discover, the answer to both questions is the same. And we'll tell you what that is in a little while. I thought when I got into it, that everyone would be asking these questions. Because you know, I'd seen Barack Obama speak. I'd seen his interviews. I didn't think he had the uh, literary kind of background to write a book of this quality. And so I went online and I Googled uh, you know, Barack Obama ghostwriter. I figured I'd, there'd be plenty of people already discussing who Obama's ghostwriter is. Instead, I got answers like this. Unlike John McCain, Barack Obama does not need a ghostwriter. I could not find a single disputing head on either side of the aisle, including on the right side of the aisle. And Christopher Buckley, William Buckley's son, voted for Barack Obama because he was such a gifted wordsmith. Sorry, Christopher, I'm going to disabuse you of your notions tonight. Um, I thought everyone would be asking these questions. But as I discovered, I was the only one asking these questions. That's kind of a lonely, weird place to be, which I'll tell you about. Switching gears a little bit. As anyone who has seen me play can attest, I am not a particularly good golfer. In fact, I would consider myself a double bogey golfer. 
And whereas a pro would shoot a, a four on a par four, I would shoot a six. A pro would shoot a three on a par three, I would shoot a five. So for me, if I ever break 100, it's Miller time, you know, just something to celebrate. And there are two reasons I've been able to achieve this level of success. One is a lack of natural talent. And secondly, and I combine that with an absolute failure to practice. And the combination together is, makes me as good a golfer as I am, which is 100 plus on the average day. Now, to achieve true superiority in any craft, let's say take Tiger Woods, it takes two things. One is an extraordinary natural talent. And secondly, a total dedication to your craft, a deep, deep commitment and a discipline to do the best you can do. Uh, in his book, The Outliers, has anyone read that book by Malcolm Gladwell? Good book. Um, he talks about what he calls the 10,000 hour rule. And what they say, and the psychologists say, is to achieve mastery of any subject, any craft, it takes not only a great natural talent, but roughly 10,000 hours of practice. Uh, Gladwell cites the Beatles, and he cites Mozart, and he cites Tiger Woods. If you read the history, say, for instance, of Charlie Parker, a Kansas City jazz great, 10, 12 hours a day of practice when he was an adolescent. That's how you gum that good. You get so good you can break the rules because you know what the rules are. Now, in Barack Obama's case, he skipped about 9,900 hours <laughs> of that process. If you read, you know, writers are, are like golfers, are like musicians. It takes both a natural talent and it takes a lot of hard work. In Barack Obama's case, or let's, for instance, the case I read this summer, uh, the biography of Christopher Hitchens, his uh, memoir called Hitch. And in it, he writes about himself as a writer from the time he's a child. He's always writing. He has influences we learn about, his struggles, his successes, his failures, his breakthroughs, his gifts, his, you know, the things he lacks, the people he admires. Another character who, whose memoir I read this year too, and uh, everyone in the media should have read, and there'll be more talk about him before the evening is through, is Frank Marshall Davis, uh, the mentor of Barack Obama when he was in Hawaii. The, uh, he's a member of the Communist Party USA. He's a pornographer, but he's also an excellent writer. He grew up in, uh, he grew up black in uh, the first half of the century in the cent central part of Kansas. I mean, he suffered more discrimination in the average day than Barack Obama did in his entire life. But he writes about it with grace and intelligence. He's an excellent writer. But his book is about becoming a writer. It's about the struggles, the influences, his attack of journalitis, he calls it. He goes on to become a very serious poet and a very serious uh, journalist. That's how you get to be good. In Barack Obama's case, he skipped it all. In, in the book, uh, Dreams from My Father, he mentions his role as a writer only once. He said, I made some journal entries and wrote some very bad poetry. Now, I'm not gonna deny he did that, especially the very bad poetry part, but that is not a writer make. Now, once I was uh, suspicious, then I started looking around to see what did Obama write that might have made it into print. There wasn't much for a guy who wrote uh, this, this classic, great, acclaimed memoir, there wasn't much to see. What I did find uh, was uh, one paper that he had, uh, an article he had written when he was a senior at Columbia University called Breaking uh, the War Mentality. Now, although thematically it's no sillier than the average paper written by a Columbia undergraduate in 1983, stylistically it's a disaster. It's an utter, total disaster. Um, this, this might be excusable if, you know, for instance, a year before this, they had found Barack Obama in an Indonesian cave being raised by wolves. But to this point, <laughs> he had just spent the last four years in America's best colleges. He's graduating from an Ivy League school. The eight years before that, he spent at Hawaii's best prep school. The writer we meet as a 21-year-old in 1983 is 90% as good as that writer will ever be. That's simply the way it works. I've taught writing at all levels, from high school to graduate school. I would love to say I could take a student and make him twice as good, but I can't. If I can make him 10% better, I'm thrilled. Um, and that's the way it is. This is his signature. This is his DNA. In this one essay, 1,800 words long, he has five sentences in which the noun, the subject, does not agree with the verb. I mean, this. It is an embarrassment to Columbia University that they allowed this to be published. I mean, it went unedited, I, I presume. I presume there was no editor for the sundial. My children were writing better than this in grade school, seriously. And your children were too. <laughs>